Uh, good day, everybody. Today's International Industrial Ecology Day um, event uh, that we organize online for the second time, uh, which starts in Sydney, Australia, at uh, early in, in or at midnight uh, uh, Universal Time, and ends at the U.S. West Coast, um, twenty-three hours later or so, and so. Uh, my name is Edgar Hertwig. I'm a professor of industrial ecology at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Um, and uh, the session is, an, is titled Cutting Edge Applications of Industrial Ecology in the Built Environment. Welcome. Um, we are recording this session just for your information, and we will likely share this um, in a YouTube channel. Um, I would like to welcome uh, all my presenters and panelists, as well as the audience. Um, the focus here is really on the use of industrial ecology um, in uh, practice um, and how we go from research to applications and how, th how these things um, you know, become useful in, in practice. And I, I have a little story just um, just the other day, I had a, a former student who sent me a message uh, on LinkedIn um, and she had graduated um, in the early days of our program. Um, and uh, she actually thanked me for, for starting, you know, contributing to starting this. Um, and said, well, you know, now I do all this interesting uh, stuff, uh, working for a municipality, I use life cycle assessment, and we, you know, buildings are important, and we are reducing environmental impacts uh, through these tools, and uh, uh, she was really glad to have that type of job, and uh, finds it interesting to, that this has become so popular now. Um, and a lot of our early students were actually sort of struggling to find a place, and it, it took a while uh, before uh, the wider building construction industry and the consultancies that are associated with, with that industry and the um, municipalities that, that basically uh, regulate construction found, discovered the tools. And of course, the current drive to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions is an important cause uh, for this interest in trying to understand uh, what the environmental impacts of buildings and um, and the infrastructure are. Uh, so uh, we have assembled a group that um, consists of uh, researchers, uh, consultants, uh, and people who, who work um, at at organizations that are sort of intermediaries and advise policy makers and so on. Um, and the first presenter today is Karine Lausillet. Uh, she uh, has a PhD uh, from the Industrial Ecology Program at NTNU, uh, where she worked with Helge Bratepe on the Zero Emission Neighborhood uh, Research Center. Uh, and uh, then she shifted to a position uh, at Sintef, which is a research organization in Trondheim, a large research organization. Um, and uh, so she will give us the first presentation today. Uh, so I will give the word over to you, Karin, if you could share your presentation and, um, and your, your video. Yeah, can you see my presentation uh, presenter mode? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Edgar, for the opportunity to present. I do sincerely uh, appreciate. So, as mentioned, I'm working at uh, Sintef uh, in the Department of Architecture, Material and Construction. And recently, I became the research manager of the, of the group of material and uh, construction. So at Sintef, we love to um, work and to have this ecosystem view. And when we conduct research ecosystem in terms of uh, entrepreneur, public authorities, uh, business, investors, and uh, research. Just a word uh, on my group. Uh, I told, I talked to them every other day about the benefits of industrial ecology. So I thought it was fair enough just to 
to tell you a little bit why they are so important. So if I were to describe in one sentence what we do in uh, my group, uh, I will say uh, we focus on the development of building materials, the use in construction, their durability and impact on the environment. So on the left side, you have the material uh, side people with a very strong focus on uh, cement and uh, concrete. Uh, on the, um, here you have the construction, so those materials going to the, into the buildings. And here you have uh, us, the industrial, industrial ecology people. Some, some of you may recognize some uh, non faces uh, here. Uh, yeah, so it's really to go from the material to the building to the neighborhood. So that goes to the benefits as a society as a, as a whole. The first case is going to be uh, on the use of input, input output and the LCA, so hybrid LCA. Uh, at the neighborhood uh, scale. Here, this is a neighborhood uh, located in uh, Norway called Udalid. Uh, yes, it's uh, per today. It's not like it's look today. It's like it's going to look in maybe 10 years or so. So today, it's only the kindergarten and the school that are built, and the residential part is going to be built uh, over time. So if we have this uh, neighborhood, uh, Udalid, and uh, we want to conduct uh, cut, cutting edge uh, methods of industrial ecology on, on this. So the first uh, thing to do is really to define uh, the case study, so part one. But then uh, we developed uh, together with Robert Crawford from the University of Melbourne and André Stefan as well in Belgium. We developed a hybrid coefficient on, for each of the main materials by using the process-based database, equipment three, three and as an input database, uh, Excel, Excel base. And then uh, the conventional step by uh, multiplying those uh, emissions uh, intensities with the material in, to go from material to the building, and then to the building to the neighborhoods by adding everything also happening on the construction uh, side. So if we look a little bit at the, at the results, so here, uh, first on the material side, on a y-axis, you can see for the main uh, product, uh, main materials, timber product, plastic, metal, insulation, plaster product, and concrete. And on x-axis, we can see the contribution of the process data and EO data. So we can see that the proportion of the input output data varies from 10 to 78 percent, with an average of 34 and a median of uh, 24. So what we can see as well is the materials that have the emission more spread along the value chains have a higher procedure error or a higher share of um, input output data, which is the case, for example, for a uh, gypsum uh, plasterboard. The opposite is true uh, for uh, materials such as concrete, who has a very high share of uh, direct emission, and those type of material uh, are pretty well covered with uh, process data. Uh, then if we take those materials to the building level, and then we add a bit of regulation in terms of uh, construction standards, in terms of ambiental assessment of building, then we have the typical um, life cycle stages, so product stage A1, A3, uh, the material, and then transport of the material to the construction site uh, A4, uh, everything happening on the, on the construction site uh, A5, and then the material re replacement over time uh, before. But then uh, what we found out is that uh, those standards are based on process uh, LCA, and then they cover most, I uh, cover a high uh, a fair share of the emission happening on the construction site and on the building uh, on the construction of the neighborhood, but they don't cover uh, all emissions. And in fact, uh, we added a new category uh, called others, which account for 40% of the overall uh, emissions. If we go on, uh, it's the same uh, neighborhood uh, Edalir, but this time uh, we combine uh, MFA and uh, LCA. So if we take uh, Edalir with the kindergarten, school, and residential area to be built, and then we applied, I would say, conventional uh, building stock uh, dynamic over time with the typical construction, renovation, and demolition activities over time in part one. And then in part two, on the right hand side, uh, then we add on top of that, we add very detailed uh, material inventories. 
per each building type. And then uh, for each material, we add uh, emission intensity. In order to have N part three, the material flow uh, over time, as well as the emission uh, flow uh, over time. And then for this neighborhood, Edaliet, this is how uh, the emission uh, storyline, if you wish, uh, will look over time. And then in order to make the, the result be more digestible, we group, of course, the different type of materials in the, the main groups. But this is how we can potentially look like. So what we can really see in the baseline scenarios, we can really see this peak of, of emission at the beginning. Uh, which accounts for 40-50% of the overall emission, and then uh, the emissions spread a bit more over time. And uh, if we apply material efficient strategies in terms of more intensive use, lifetime, more intensive use, lifetime extension, improving yield in production, then we can see the, uh, the following uh, benefits. So at the beginning of the, um, of the lifetime of the neighborhood, which is in year 2030, was where the whole neighborhood is built, then you can really see this peak of emission induced by the construction of these buildings. But uh, if you use, for example, a more intensive use uh, strategy, such as reducing the floor area per person uh, in terms of building area, then you can already uh, decrease this peak of emission if you're a bit more careful in the material choice, then you can again uh, decrease this uh, peak. And then over time, then we go a little bit more in B, lifetime extension, in terms of material lifetime extension, but also the building as a whole, then you can again uh, decrease a little bit those emissions over time. And then improving yield in production, which is more in goals to the, to, the material, to the material production today, but also uh, over time, so they can uh, decrease uh, again. Uh, and then uh, last case I wanted to show you was on the use of, uh, of MFA and LCA at municipality scale, which is a bit of a um, uh, wider scale this time. So from the building to the um, uh, neighborhood to the municipality. So this, if you have Norway, uh, Trondheim, and then you have this uh, case here called Knowledge Access uh, in Trondheim. I'm located in Trondheim just for the information. Uh, and then again, uh, this case, and then we apply um, MFA technique uh, over time. So building stock for uh, each of the different type of building. We had uh, 20 or so type of uh, building, residential, but also service buildings. And then again, we apply um, construction, renovation, demolition over time. Uh, we have georeference geo uh, the building stock by using cadastral data, and I'm going to show you on the next, next slide why it was so important. And then on this building stock, we added the energy demand combined with the technology efficiency in order to have the energy use over time and the related uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission intensity for each energy carriers, but also for uh, the material use in terms of the new construction, but also a renovation uh, over time. And then for this particular uh, case, we have the results, the result, part of the result. It was really the idea that we could really go to a municipality to really show uh, their, their municipality and how it will evolve over time in terms of uh, building time type first, but also in terms of uh, development. We had very close contact to, with them in order to understand which areas of the municipality will develop over time, and also in terms of what type of uh, building. So this is shown in this first uh, heat map. And then in the second heat map, then you can really see the energy use over time based on different scenarios that I will not go into this now, but you can uh, really refer to this uh, study if you want to know a bit more. But really, uh, it was really the use of uh, MFA, LCA over time, and also I think very powerful use of um, heat maps to show the results. Thank you for your attention. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Karin. It was really interesting to see how this develops uh, your tools to actually display the emissions of buildings that are spatially located and, and to develop these scenarios of urban space. Um, so we are going to have opportunity to ask questions and engage in a discussion after the first four speakers. So I'll, I'll go rec right to the next uh, speaker, uh, and this is Freya Rasmussen. Uh, Freya is a postdoc at Aalborg University today, 
Uh, tomorrow, she will start as assistant professor in civil engineering at, at NTNU. Um, and uh, she will uh, uh, tell us about uh, applied building LCA in Denmark. Uh, research meets practice meets regulation. And this is really about setting, uh, developing standards and uh, making standards ma mandatory or not, and, and that important question. Uh, so if you could share your presentation for Ella, I think, mm -hmm. Karin, you need to get out of your presentation, right? And then we can see for Ella's presentation. Uh, and over to you. Thanks, Edgar. I guess it's there now. Right? Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, and, and by the way, there is a Q&A, and I think the first question is still to Karin. So, so that um, if you write Q&As, I think uh, it's good if you're more specific who you're addressing your question to. Thank you. OK, yes, uh, thanks for the introduction, Edgar, and for having me here today. I'll give you a brief introduction to uh, how LCA has been integrated into the Danish building regulation or how it's about to be. Uh, which is uh, something I've been involved with uh, quite intensely for the past couple of years. Uh, yes, so for now I'm affiliated with Olbock University. Tomorrow it will be NTNU. Um, so we all know about the significant environmental and climate impacts from the building and construction industry. And for a long time, this has been dealt with, at least the Danish conditions, uh, by voluntary means. So uh, building practitioners has engaged with the, uh, these uh, green certification systems such as DGNB or BREEAM, where LCA uh, is, is part of the larger sort of pool of criteria that, that are assessed as part of, of obtaining these certifications. And now in the past couple of years, we've moved into a phase where it's becoming more of a thing that, that's a mandatory uh, thing in in several countries, not only Denmark. So it's it has been a, there has been a documentation requirement in the Netherlands for several years. Nico will tell about how it has been implemented in the city of Zurich as well. So uh, on different scales, it has been it has been introduced already. And of course, sort of what the building uh, designers and practitioners want to know is how to minimize the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the one project or another. And the ones of us working with LCA in detail in our everyday life, of course, we know it's not that easy to point to the best low emission building design because we, there are several choices, several options uh, that, that determines what the best solution is, whether it's recycled materials, whether it's uh, zero energy use, uh, densification, several strategies are in place. And uh, sort of the, the answer depends on how, so the answer to which, which what, what the low emission building design is depends on, for instance, how you allocate between systems, how you uh, define your system and, and the substitutions in the system, how you account for or do not account for the biogenic uptake and release, which life cycle stages are included, how much of the building do you include in the, as part of the inventory? And then also, of course, about the data you use, just as Karina showed, whether it's bottom-up uh, process-based or it's hybrid. So it's not easy to come up with an exact answer on, uh, on which is the right building to build. And that's also difficult to put into the, to the regulation then. And of course, we do have a standardized approach to define the or to, to approaching the LCA uh, of buildings via these uh, EN 15978 standards. That defines what we, we determine as part of the different life cycle stages. But still a lot of, uh, of room for interpretation in this standard as well. So a lot of our research, uh, the, the, what I've done with Oberg University has been focused on sort of this rather gentle demand from the building sector and also cooperating with the authorities on uh, establishing these voluntary measures. And so we've been interacting about uh, what could be a, an, a, um, a method that could be, that is not to put too much work on the industry because if it's voluntary, then it really matters um, 
how many working hours they put into it, of course. Also, making sure that we push to, to the product data side so we get more information about the different products on the market. And then also what we have been working with is also providing tools uh, freely available for the industry. So it can actually, so it's, it's easier to implement uh, in their practice. Now, moving into this new phase with regulation, uh, we've had a, a quite significant change to the way we've worked. So this is the policymakers in Denmark when they decided uh, maybe it's two years ago that that uh, LCA documentation and limit values uh, should be part of the billing regulations from uh, 2023. So starting in just one month. So that really put a stress on the demand. Suddenly everyone in the industry knew they had to cope with this within a few years and, and had to deal with it in the way they, they did their, uh, the, the processes and the way they did their, their assessment. So especially this thing about integrating limit values puts a pressure on how we then establish the method because the, in the policy making process, they would look into the research that, that we had done in the building area and they would say, okay, we find this number here in your reports about the median value of buildings being around 13 or 14 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per square meter per year. Uh, uh, could we could we just set the, the this limit value a bit lower and then uh, and then we would make an improvement to the to the future buildings if it's in the regulation and then they decided on this number and now uh, now it's just a very fixed thing in the regulation that we have to deal with when trying to moderate the method because of course we did not have the perfect method in place at this point in time where, where it was all voluntary. But they had to base their political uh, intervention on something. So they built it on that. It's not that it's a Im totally imperfect method, but you know it, we could improve it and we would like to improve it. But now as with this policy process, it's really hard to, 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 to pull any handles because it's, it's quite locked. We're locked into one method. We're locked into one type of product data because of these limit values. So that's an interesting place to be to, to, to find out how much can we actually change or how little can we change in the current situation? And when do we then have the opportunity to, to try to push these uh, changes on the method and the data through? But anyway, now we have the established method uh, for the Danish building regulation to, to uh, come into place in, in a very short time. So now we, based on the method, we can actually, we don't have all these open questions now because now we just point to the method and say, well, this, these are the rules. These are the rules we will follow at least for the next two years. But it would be odd if we changed the rules a lot for the next uh, revision of the regulation. And so the point is that as a researcher, it's quite difficult to, to be in this, uh, in this policy environment where things are pretty sort of tightly set because we usually want to take in several perspectives and maybe an, another system boundary and another perspective of scale. But, uh, but this is really a new discipline for us. So it's a balancing act and it's also about, uh, I think it's about research integrity. How much, uh, how much can I, uh, can I cope with, uh, with these, um, what do you call it, um, compromises that we have to do between what we would like to have in the research. And it's also, of course, it's also positive that it's being implemented and used. But yeah, so the last point is that we should, we shouldn't just we shouldn't just settle with what there is now, but also keep trying to push the improvements to methods and data and, and challenge what's, what's in place. That was it. So I welcome any questions and look forward to the debate afterwards. Yes, it looks like there is a question already on the Q&A for you to answer. Yep. Um, and so thank you, Freya. This is uh, quite <laughs> nerve wracking, right? When suddenly your uh, science 
comes under scrutiny by practitioners because it means something, right? And they, they have to actually adapt to wh whatever you find. And then you say, well, there's still some uncertainty in the methods. And the fact that this now becomes a standard really means that, that it, in some sense, it, it, it gives you a lot less flexibility on the scientific side. And of course, that's something we cannot avoid, right? And, and so as long as it becomes, as soon as it becomes important for the outside, I think it's it's quite clear that that, that happens. Um, so now we, we have had a case of a researcher who has worked on uh, developing standards. So now we, the next case is a researcher who has gone into over into practice and actually uh, the use of these tools and methods in the city of Zurich. Um, and so over to Nico Heron, who has a PhD from ETH Zurich and spent some time at Yale University as a postdoc and um, and now works for the city of Zurich. And so please, Nico. Thank you very much, Edgar. Um, I guess it's the perfect transition from Freya's uh, presentation. I'm the guy who's being held responsible <laughs> when we don't meet the net zero targets in the city of Zurich. Um, I'm the team lead for the sustainable construction uh, section in the uh, construction department of the city of Zurich. And yeah, I've, uh, I'm an industrial ecologist who has turned a little bit on the, on the administration side of things. And so today I want to talk about the, uh, the goal, net zero, the goal that the city of Zurich has established for itself. Um, I will give you a bit more details in a minute, um, but maybe shortly about what we do. So we are a little bit in an awkward spot. Um, we are basically uh, the interface between the building owners, the building users, and um, the architects and the planners. So we are kind of the building um, owner representative um, responsible for carrying out any construction projects of uh, city-owned uh, um, property. Um, we are quite a, a large office and um, there was in Zurich, it's important to know, there was already a referendum in 2008 where the so-called 2000 Watt Society, uh, also a, a climate goal, um, was accepted by the, by the public. And this is when our, um, our sustainable construction group was founded. And um, we've been working with uh, seven people on, on this issue. And we, we developed quite, quite some knowledge and uh, expertise in this field. So what do we do? Um, uh, we like to think um, in our uh, sustainable construction section, we like to think that we pioneered recycling concrete in, in Switzerland. Um, we really pushed forward that recycling concrete is becoming a standard for basically all of our construction projects. We are using recycling concrete now. Um, we are also also pushing forward LCA, so we are pushing forward the development of LCA databases. So there's the so-called KBOB um, LCA database. It's a it's something like a sister database of the Ecomment database, not as well known, um, but certainly uh, worth taking a look at for any um, construction practitioners here in the call. Um, we define and we set the goals that are in line with the city's um, climate goals. So we have, for instance, for our construction projects, we have um, clear and actionable uh, standards that we um, set for every construction project and we also control. And we are piloting uh, a lot of um, pilot cases and, and research projects um, in, in an applied sense. So for instance, we have three construction projects we are where we are trying um, to use re reused uh, building components. Um, I, I very quickly during uh, Freya's talk um, also put this triangle here. Um, she was talking about the 12 kilogram uh, CO2 um, or should be lower to. Um, so we are also controlling every and um, each and every of our construction projects. Green bubbles means um, it's uh, uh, refurbishment projects that we've carried out. Blue bubbles means uh, it's new construction projects. The further to the right, the more emissions we have from material. The further up, the more emissions we have uh, from the energy demand. This is really my favorite slide. I will come back to that in, a, in another minute. Um, but we also, like, as I said, we, we set the standards. We have the 12 kilogram. We have had that for quite a while. Um, and we are also seeing how we can actually get there with our construction projects. 
So yeah, the net zero target, um, it is, uh, it is uh, something that really came from the pressure of the street during the climate strike movements. So already last year, the city council decided for the city administration to, um, to, to, to come up with net zero goals. So for direct emissions, so um, on, within the city parameters, um, the city administration has to go net zero by 2035, which is everybody who does, does construction is like basically tomorrow. Um, we also have a goal for indirect emissions. Um, not every city that has a net zero goal has also indirect emissions covered. Uh, we have one that, that is nine, minus 30% until uh, 2035. And very recently there was the referendum. So the people actually voted to also have a net zero vision until 2040, um, which covers the whole population and um, all the other cons consumption sectors. Um, I guess in this audience, it's not really necessary to talk a lot about the relevance of, of material and embodied emissions, but um, I think it's it's really uh, very important to keep in mind that this is the elephant in the room. I think um, the city especially has, has done a lot of um, district heating and so on, so um, I think energy supply has been mostly decarbonized in the last years, and the real issue is becoming the construction material. Um, also in Switzerland, there is no legislation on embodied emissions, and I don't know any country where it is the case yet. Um, I think this is still a, a huge issue we have to tackle. Something we are looking into in that context, because net zero also means you have negative emissions, right? Because you have your positive emissions, you subtract the negative emissions. We are also looking at that, and we all know 1.5 degree is the target. Uh, just a reminder, we're basically already there. We, we will probably overshoot anyway. Um, but there is different research projects. This is an interesting paper by Matthews et al., where they look at the impact or the benefit of uh, negative emissions from uh, carbon storage. Um, there is an effect, but it's, uh, it is not maybe as, as pronounced as we may hope for. Um, but we are also looking at, at the feasibility of storing carbon in the building sector. So really, my my issue is I'm I'm a little bit at the interface. I'm uh, of the stake of different stakeholders in the construction project. So we have the pol policy, we have the um, the building owners, we have the building practitioners, the, the users, the schools, and so on. And we are really uh, trying to come up with a process where we can get everybody in the boat and see where the re responsibilities are to get to this net zero target um, by 2035. And um, our idea was to basically produce a calculation tool um, which we can use on the spot with the different stakeholders. Um, and we identified a bunch of different strategies that we implemented in this calculation tools. Um, so the different strategies, I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail because we don't have the time here, but we're looking at like refurbishment. So doing less new construction as opposed to refurbishments, um, you know, just using less square meter per person, doing more material efficiency, so doing more with the material we, we are using, wood construction is certainly an important lever, and so on. All of these measures, we have some studies and did some plausible plausibility checks, we have an estimated potential, and we also looked at the time horizon we think um, these uh, measures can be implemented in. Just one example, again, my favorite slide. So um, one example uh, is the, the doing more refurbishments as opposed to uh, new construction. So we, in a city, we always have the potential to densify our city, uh, meaning, you know, we can top up existing buildings instead of, you know, doing a tabula a rasa project. And we really see that the benefit is really uh, tremendous in terms, at least for material. Um, we, we have an average, we see something like 10 kilograms per square meter in a year from new constructions, um, as opposed to uh, roughly four uh, kilograms for uh, refurbishment projects. So these kind of numbers we um, put into our Excel calculation tool, um, where we have these different, um, these different strategies implemented. It's, it's much less refined than what Karin showed us just earlier. It's it's really a very simple Excel tool. Um, we did that on purpose because we wanted to have it available very quickly. And it's really the idea is to, to have something we can apply in the discussion with the different stakeholders. Um, so uh, what, what we do now is we can look at different um, development pathways. So how many schools are we going to build? How many uh, housing we will have to, to provide to the community and so on? And there we can test the different strategies. So very similar to what Karin showed us earlier, we can now test like, okay, if we do wood construction, how much closer to our target by 2035 will that get us? 
And the prob problem is really like we have these shared responsibilities. So we have the architects that can maybe use less materials. Uh, we have the industry that can provide us with CO2 free steel maybe one day. Um, we have the building owners that it's only them who can decide to use less uh, less square meter per person or per, per school children. Um, so we have these different shared responsibilities. And, and that tool helps us to, you know, in the discussion, say like, okay, how, how much, guys, do, do you think you can reduce the square meter per person? Uh, we try to answer the question, like, um, what, what is the, um, the upstream emissions from future construction materials and so on? Um, this is really an ongoing process, so please don't cite me on any of these numbers and results, but um, something very interesting I, I found in using this tool is um, we, we all these green measures, which is wood construction or you know doing more refurbishments and, and uh, more in, um, more material efficiency. Um, these are basically, in my opinion, these are uh, measures that are available already today. Um, when we look at what the construction or material industry can do, that is maybe more on this yellow part here. Um, I would argue, you know, CO2 free steel will not be available before 2030. And, you know, um, the effect combined the effect of everything, all of these instant measure measures we have available is when you combine it and the reduction in the cu cumulative emissions over time is at least as pronounced as it is what we can expect from the from the industry. So I really that is my statement like, OK, whatever we can do, we have to do today. Um, sufficiency, you know, uh, less, uh, more refurbishments and so on, um, because we can't wait for industry to to give us the one fits all solution. So that brings me already to my um, to my conclusions. I think you know these new climate goals they um, they require a, a mix of all options we have on the table. I think um, you know the building owners sometimes have the have the notion that you know we just order um, CO two free buildings, but that won't work. Uh, material efficiency is a very important instant measure, something we can apply basically today. Um, the, the, it, it requires much more of a collaboration than we've seen in the past, and it, it really takes everybody on the table to, to make important decisions. I, I think it was a good learning curve for us to, to, to create this tool, to, to use that in the discussion and to see who can contribute what. Um, so it's, it's facilitating this dialogue. And yeah, a message to all of you, like push your governments to to finally regulate embodied emissions. Yeah, that's it for my side today. Um, uh, I'm happy to take your questions later on. Hey, Nico, it looks like you have a really interesting job. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, to hear about uh, all the progress that Zurich is making. And I, I remember when I started out looking at LCAs of buildings, uh, it was really 80% to 90% of the emissions were associated with the energy use in, in the use phase, right? And so um, it's both energy efficiency and the tremendous progress that has been made in decarbonizing the energy system that we already see as an important result today. And this is, of course, you know, the first order what governments should do first. Uh, but as you point out, that some of some of these measures that industrial ecology suggests are also low-hanging fruits and can be implemented um, qu quite as as quickly. Um, I would like to go over to the next speaker. Um, so Otbjorn Dahlström Andvik uh, graduated from the Master Program of Industrial Ecology. Uh, at NTNU 10 years ago, and I just looked up because he and another student, Karen Sörnes, together wrote a, a scientific article which was published in Energy and Buildings in 2012, the uh, a first LCA of a passive house uh, in Norway, and he went right on to uh, an engineering consulting company, Asplan Viak, where he still works. Um, and he has been practicing what he has learned in school. And uh, that's, of course, something that we also are proud to see. So over to you, uh, Otbjorn. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Can hear yes. You well. yes. Thank you for the introduction, Edgar. And it's uh, nice to be uh, here today. And thank you for inviting me. I will uh, share my screen. Uh, now you can see the screen. Yes, we can. Yes, nice to be here. And I will today talk about from um, 
the theory uh, from NTNU and I'll say to EPD and how uh, we use this information in the practical everyday life, uh, working as a consultant uh, and how we can use that to help our clients to make the best environmental decisions. And my background is, as Edgar said, um, I have a bachelor's in logistics engineering from Trondheim and uh, from uh, an industrial ecology in Trondheim in 2011. And I work as an advisor or a consultant in uh, Aspen Viak with the field of uh, energy and environments. And um, usually it's most LCA of buildings, uh, rail roads and roads but also uh, in the making of EPDs and uh, use of EPDs to, to the clients to see the difference, how the different products can uh, affect the buildings and the material use in the buildings. Uh, I will assume that many of you know what an EPD is, uh, but uh, very brief, briefly, uh, an EPD is a type 3 eco label third party verified uh, document uh, based on LCA, and that declares the potential environmental impact of product and services. Uh, in uh, It's a standardized and objective practice that ensures comparability and transparency transparency between the different producers of building materials. And this provides the necessary documentation of green public procurement. Uh, at least in Norway, we have the, in the, the last years uh, seen the focus and our trend to have requirements on CO2 emissions when we um, buy products and materials. And then one NPD can then be the document that describes the uh, how this product or that product is com uh, compared to the procurement. And the main reason is not just to document uh, the environmental profile, but it's also to give the manufacturers insight to their own productions, uh, find the hotspots, how they can be better in the future and what they should focus on when they want to invest uh, to reduce uh, emissions. In Norway, we have EPD Norge that is, um, uh, is the, in charge of all the EPDs. And uh, recently we have uh, EPD Norge, Norge has uh, got over 2000 published EPDs. EPDs are mostly on building materials, but also uh, furniture and energy systems and other kinds of uh, non-building materials are also uh, in the future uh, the focus of EPDs. This is uh, an overview of uh, an EPD. You have a front page for a specified producer and a project and uh, some general information of what the EPD content is. This is, uh, for an example, one cubic meter of uh, timber. And then a description of the LCA calculation rules, uh, how the LCA is made for that EPD. I will not go into detail, but uh, all EPDs are available online, so it's uh, um, available to find much information uh, online. It's more like uh, for food uh, nutrition facts. You can see the content of that uh, food product or the content of that building product. What is the LCA uh, environmental impact in global warming potential and other impact categories to produce one cubic meter of wood or one cubic meter of concrete and so on. When we are doing LCA and carbon footprint of buildings simplified, we need to know the amount of materials uh, to build that building and uh, the emission factor of that material. Uh, in sum, all of that will be uh, the carbon footprint of that building. Uh, the amount of materials, we can work with architects and engineers to reduce uh, amounts and maybe change from that product to this product. And also to see the function if, could we have more people working in the office space by shared office, for example, uh, increase opening hours of the store and so on to use the build environment as much as possible. 
But when we, when the architects and engineers have uh, decided that the building design, we need to find the best materials available to build that building. And then we need mission factors. And then you can use uh, the databases, Econvent, for example, or EPDs. Uh, and the best way then is to uh, use uh, find EPDs, compare producers, and then find the product that uh, is best to build that building. As an example, uh, we have been involved in making many EPDs, and here's an example for natural stone. Uh, the functional unit then is uh, what is the emissions or Im impact category impacts to make one ton of natural stone. Then we went to uh, different producers and found a complete list of energy and materials to produce that uh, um, amount of stone and divided all the inputs uh, and waste to, for all the produced products. We went through the quarry to see uh, what is actually being doing uh, in the quarry, uh, which machinery are you using? How can you make uh, the mountain to actually products in the building to the production site uh, at least for natural stone it's a um, large amount of hand work and not so heavy machinery so people are working with the stone by hand and then to a flow chart uh, we need to convert uh, that uh, from products uh, manufacturer to more or less how we can do that in LCA, what is the material and energy input, what is the waste through all the, the life cycle of that uh, production. And this is uh, could be simplified, but uh, you have all, all allocation uh, problems. You can have uh, maybe um, problems to find what is up in the value chain, which products are you buying? Uh, usually, in, the companies have good control of, uh, of energy use, but uh, further upstream in the value chain is quite could be quite difficult to find uh, details. And then to the LCA results in the EPD. So to produce one ton of natural stone, it's about 86 kilograms of CO2 equivalents. Another example is uh, for a building. Uh, this is uh, the emissions uh, for a building we have uh, worked with in global warming potential uh, for the building parts, uh, foundations, structural frame, and so on. And then the goal was how could that this building be uh, built the best way possible with uh, the lowest emissions possible. As you can see, the slabs, uh, concrete slabs, is around 24% of the total emissions. And the solar panels, PV panels, is around 17%. And around the 75% of the emissions is from constructing the building. And uh, so it's important to have focus on the slabs, concrete, the PV panels, and the construction phase to see, to find hot spots where to reduce the impacts. This uh, calculation is in the start based on database numbers for PV panels because we didn't have any EPDs. But we have been working with uh, PV panel producers to make EPDs for a PV panel. And uh, we found out that in the valid chain of PV panel, it is the wafer and the solar red silicon that is maybe 80% of the total emissions of PV panel. So then we have also worked with the producers of solar grade silicon. And to the left, you can see that uh, the, the column to the left is a database number for silicon. And the column to the right is a producer, EPD producer of silicon. It's around 80% reduction to have company specific data compared to database. The same you can see with wafer. If you use uh, then this EPD number in the wafer production, you can also have a huge reduction compared to the database numbers and also to the PV panel. So from around 200 kilograms of CO2 per square meters panel, we can uh, find an EPD uh, producer of PV panels to go over 50% lower than the, the database number of PV panel. 
using that number back again in the calculations, then we can reduce this uh, PV panel uh, numbers up around 50%. And uh, this will reduce the building carbon footprint of 9%. Working like this in all the different uh, building uh, parts and all the materials, we can then find uh, the best way to reduce the emissions of the building and then uh, always be in front of requiring the best materials in the procurement also. So briefly from LCA to PD, uh, we use LCA as a tool for producers of building materials. We go to the um, and producers uh, conduct LCA, make EPDs, uh, find hotspots uh, where should you invest your money to have the highest environmental uh, reduction, uh, and then document that in an EPD. So the producer can use that uh, in the procurement later on and uh, as uh, being the best producer as possible. This was uh, this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Apian. Uh, very interesting. I, I'm just wondering, and now we can start this discussion amongst all the speakers. Um, you know, I, I think what you what you show is that that numbers are, you know, they can change, and of course. A photovoltaics is a technology that has gone undergone a tremendous development and the costs have come down to levels that we we had never expected right and one of the mechanisms by which costs come down is of course that the amounts of materials um, become less wafers become thinner and uh, the other mechanism is that the processes become more efficient because you have sort of economies of scale. Uh, and I think all of those things are, are probably happening here. And, and that's the background for why you see these emissions decreasing so much. Hopefully it's not the, the choices of your system boundary that are different or, or, or something like that. Um, and so I'm really, I think it, it, it raises a question um, and that is, is the data good enough, right? And uh, is it good enough for the decisions that we need to take? And I, I think what you have shown is this tremendous development of the number of EPDs that exist for buildings and building components. And, and that's of course demand driven, but it's also supply driven if, if there are uh, companies that want to sell their products and get a, an advantage uh, having this uh, product declaration because some customers are actually looking for low emissions components and materials. Um, and so I, I'm just, I just want to throw this out to all of you. Um, you know, is the data good enough? Are we learning something from the data becoming better? And um, or, or is there still so much uncertainty on these LCAs in terms of the specific system boundaries and methods and assumptions that it's really hard to compare those numbers to each other? Maybe a quick thought from my side. Sorry, mm -hmm. Freya, for <laughs> jumping just ahead the queue. Um, because we have the same issue. So we in Switzerland, there is this KBO we list I mentioned with LCA data, which is extremely useful to us. And it's it's generic data. It's intentional generic data, like there's only one concrete or one steel beam and so on. But producers can come with their EPDs and, and have them like reevaluated and get them in there. And something we see is that the EPDs, the quality of EPDs differs so much. So I would kind of re reiterate your question and ask is is epd good enough for us <laughs> yeah. any thoughts from the others freya <laughs> yeah just uh, kind of along the same line i guess it's um <laughs> the, the one piece of data may not be good enough so we would need uh, to work with ranges instead of just putting all our our um, trust into uh, one piece of data on this mm. one product. And I think uh, one of the key messages uh, from, from what we've seen in our research is also that it, it doesn't matter whether you choose one or the other uh, fiber board uh, plate for your building. It, it doesn't matter how you design the building and whether you choose to, and how you use it and, 
and whether you choose to go for a whole other material composition. So it's not the same product against the same product type, mm -hmm. and then and then comparing the EPDs. It's uh, it's like right. larger decisions where it makes sense. So in some sense, it might not be the precise number that is important, but to, to give you the right order of magnitude and, and then the architect or designer or, or uh, the customer really needs to make decisions on, on how to reduce the amount of, compon of components or materials that cause a lot of emissions, right? But it's it's the problem with numbers, right? Because the, the practitioners, they look at the numbers on the different kinds of fiberboard plates and they see, well, one is 3.2 and the other is 3.4. And then they choose uh, no. the, the, the first one <laughs> yeah. and they think they are making a good decision and it's 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 not what matters. Uh, I, I know Karine has also worked with EPDs, at, le at least Synthef is using them extensively in, in SEN. Um, I think my question, because Nico has said that the quality of EPDs are, is very different. Uh, as an expert, can you look at an EPD and recognize whether it is good quality or not? Um, because the, you don't see the inventory right <laughs> behind it. You, you don't you don't have the ability to inspect that uh, at the unit process level. Does anybody who want, uh, wants to answer that question? <laughs> In fact, we have a study where we compare uh, the use uh, of EPDs and equipment data <laughs> to see the differences. But uh, yeah, it uh, really depends. <laughs> but uh, I, I had a comment on the on the on the good enough uh, on the use of good enough use of data. Uh, now we have a, a case with the Trondheim Commune again, a municipality of, of, of Trondheim, where we had them to really create a guide and a template to report their. Green, greenhouse gas green gas greenhouse gas emission for new uh, buildings and uh, infrastructure projects. And I was thinking about you and uh, Nico when uh, you show your templates. I think it's very very well done. So I will have a talk with you. But then uh, we are really wondering about the, the the level of detail on those data. And if there is no data, <laughs> then what do you do? And uh, which reference uh, do you use? And then to be the question: Is it better to have a fair enough good data or to have no data? That's uh, also, with the question. Okay, uh, over to you, Nico. Yeah, just to, to maybe partly answer your initial question. Um, something I, I'm observing really is is that the market or the industry has, has started moving a lot, like quickly now. And, and I think that was kind of the argument by, by Freya also. Um, we, we see that like now the fancy architects they do like you know net zero buildings and so on, and, and they bring a lot of creativity to the table and, and they're not afraid of trying new stuff. And so we've seen, recently seen this presentation where they use straw as insulation material, Adobe for the, for the floors and so on. And then when I look at my LCA lists, I'm like, oh, I don't have data for that. I don't have, so I think, um, especially for new material and innovative materials, um, there's certainly a, a demand for, for new uh, inventories. Yeah. All right, out beyond. Unmute yourself, exactly. <laughs> now I'm unmuted. I totally agree that uh, uncertainty in the EPDs uh, could be quite, uh, it's a big uncertainty in the different uh, EPDs. You have uh, at least for PV panels that the development in the production is uh, changing almost every year or month. So to have an EPD that is five years old, it could be not a good number to use in the calculations. And at least uh, we should be focused more on having the uncertainty in the calculations shown than just not a number that this is better than this, because we know that it depends on the allocations and the system boundaries and everything that could be uh, put into the EPD. But on the other, on the other hand, EPDs is a, a product that is more and more um, 2000 numbers in Norway and we have EPDs in the whole Europe. So how to address the uncertainty in EPDs is, should be discussed maybe a bit more and we should have this uh, common knowledge and not just that this EPD is good or good enough. Right. 
Uh, so a, sh a short interjection with fr from Freya, and then we'll, we'll go to the next round of presentations. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, just a few, uh, brief comment on the creativity of the industry, because when doing the EPDs, uh, uh, the producers are also becoming experts in, in how the, the rules are set up and where the loopholes are in the standards. And, and so we've seen EPDs where um, the production has reduced, uh, the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions from production has reduced drastically because uh, the, 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 the company buys uh, um, biogas certificates for, uh, for the natural gas um, right. uh, processes. And, and so, so it really requires some expertise to look behind the numbers uh, in, in some of the EPDs. Right. And it's a good question, you know. Uh, what are the emission reductions that we can expect from those things? And uh, okay, very good. I think this was a nice discussion that we had. Uh, so we'll, we'll have now three new presentations. Um, and, uh, and for the audience, please feel free to use the Q&A function. If, if somebody in the audience at the end wants to sort of join our discussion, I can promote you to a panelist. If you, if you send me a message through the Q&A, then, then that could also be a possibility. Uh, so the next presenter is Shaheen Akin. Uh, he is an architect from Turkey who has, uh, is currently a PhD student at NTNU, as you can see, uh, and um, he will talk about his PhD work, uh, which looks at resource consumption of affluent Arab countries that we all focus on right now with the World Cup going on. And you see the fantastic buildings uh, already when, when, you, when you see at these broadcasts. And so, uh, we are trying to figure out what the environmental impacts are of, of those buildings and how to reduce them in the future. So uh, over to you, Shahin, please uh, share your screen. And Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Edgar. Uh, yeah, we are in the presenters mode right now. Okay. I think yeah. if you just can you can you see it? Yeah, right no, now? it's correct. It's very good. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction, Edgar. Uh, my name is Shai Uh Currently, I'm a PhD student in the Industrial Ecology Program uh, at Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Uh, I'm working with Edgar, uh, Daniel Müller, and Nico uh, in my PhD. Uh, as you all know, that uh, building stocks are quite heterogeneous uh, across countries and. Uh, changes uh, between uh, different countries. Uh, the reason for that can be uh, explained with their historical past, uh, the fashion in architecture, uh, their cultural past, uh, human behaviors, uh, their wealth uh, and economical uh, prosperities, and also the uh, uh, climate conditions of the uh, geographic uh, locations. Uh, in today's talk, I will talk about mainly about the Gulf Cooperation countries, uh, which are consist consisted of uh, Kuwait, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and uh, Qatar. Uh, almost all of them are located in the uh, Earth's desert belt, which are considered as the hottest places on Earth. And for that reason, uh, they are going to be uh, quite vulnerable to uh, climate change uh, with the global warming. Um, because uh, the households are consuming out of energy to cool down their buildings. Almost 70% of the, uh, the secondary energy usage uh, are related with uh, the cooling loads in uh, those households. And after the discovery of oil, uh, the high pop population and urbanization uh, growth rate is uh, threatened the cities. Um, the cities are expanded to further uh, extents. And uh, because of the oil, uh, they are become one of the wealthiest uh, countries uh, in the world. Uh, when we just look into the uh, GDP per capita, those countries are uh, ranked in the top 10, uh, mostly. Uh, which affects, uh, uh, which also affects the energy consumption in those countries. Um, 
because they can afford uh, using much electricity. And there is also uh, some political uh, uh, wormholes, uh, loopholes um, that uh, are including some uh, subsidies in electricity. Uh, some of the countries has using the, the cheapest electricity in the world and which is uh, has a reverse effect in the, uh, the consumption. And um, in my study, I'm looking for uh, investigation of the typical uh, building characteristics in these countries. Uh, what are the differences between uh, those countries? Uh, what are the energy consumption and the material consumption uh, of those buildings? Uh, it comes with a lot of challenges uh, because uh, the building stock needs to be modeled. Uh, but compared to European databases and European countries, there is a, a limited uh, research in the literature focusing on these countries. And also the, the cadastral codes, energy bills, uh, conducted surveys, GIS database are, and questions are quite limited. And also the building uh, energy consumption is uh, put it on uh, primary focus on recently. So in order to answer the questions, uh, I'm, uh, we are following a bottom-up archetype development process. Uh, an archetype is takes into account of individual building characteristics and groups them under uh, some um, un overarching uh, archetypes, uh, which are representative of the building stocks, rather than uh, modeling an entire building stock one by one. Uh, instead, we are uh, using archetypes to um, ease the, uh, the process of modeling. So uh, an archetype is represented with four different pillars, including form, uh, which is uh, focused on geometrical aspects. The second one is the envelope uh, of, uh, of, of a building, like including walls, uh, floors. And third one is the system, uh, such as the uh, HVAC system, uh, the conditioning, uh, conditioning uh, mechanical, uh, mechanical equipments of the system, of the building. And the last one is the, the occupancy behavior, including the operation. In the literature, there are different ways of the uh, model the reference buildings. The first one is starts with uh, literature sources and available data, and all of them are uh, examined uh, with expert, uh, expert team and a reference building, a theoretical reference building is uh, created. The second approach is starts with the actual building stock uh, by selecting an building, actual building, and with the expert senses, a real building can be used uh, for, the, uh, for an archetype. And the third approach is combine all of those uh, data at hand and create a theoretical reference building. I'm uh, following the third one uh, in my studies. Uh, after you have the archetypes, uh, then you need to uh, start the creating of the energy model. In order to do that, you need a lot of data corresponding to different dif uh, different uh, building pillars, and those data can be grouped on uh, segmented into uh, different factors, and those factors are uh, enriched with uh, a lot of technical data. And afterwards, uh, the last stage is the the form creation. Uh, for the form creation, uh, both qualitative uh, information within the historical text and also some diagrams in literature, the floor layouts, uh, some statistics related to the building stories and the areas, and some visual guidance about the building stocks uh, can be uh, harmonized. And based on the different fashions throughout the years, uh, different cohorts has different kind of characteristics uh, uh, throughout the history. And after uh, assigning the relevant uh, construction materials uh, into uh, buildings envelope ele elements, uh, we can have the 3D model, uh, which can be used to conduct simulations and uh, to calculate the energy and material intensities. So currently in our data set, we have 161 archetypes and the majority of them are located in Qatar and uh, Bahrain. Uh, sorry, a majority of them are uh, located in United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. And after you have the, uh, the energy models uh, of uh, countries, uh, we are using a building uh, framework. Uh, building stands for uh, 
building material energy software framework, uh, which is developed by Nico Heron. Um, it uses the Energy Plus and allows you to conduct uh, batch simulations for energy and material intensities. Uh, you can uh, conduct simulations for a different combination of standards, uh, climate zones, and different typologies. And the results are uh, calculated automatically and is presented in a nice way. And uh, uh, this framework has been uh, recently used in uh, United Nations Environment Program and the Resource Efficiency and Climate Change Report. And for further information, you can uh, scan the QR code or contact Nico uh, about the building uh, for further collaboration or uh, for your own use. So uh, after you have the after we uh, completed the simulations, uh, it is also possible to uh, examine in detail way uh, for individual models. Uh, you can make comparisons uh, for uh, different cohorts, compare different typologies, how they're performing in terms of energy and material. Uh, you can see the urban and rural um, settlements trends. You can see the city administrative levels trends and what their buildings are actually consisted of and the country's uh, performance. So since the Saudi Arabia has uh, much more population, and which is followed by United Arab Emirates, they have a higher consumption. But once we uh, examine the uh, the per capita uh, per capita uh, results, uh, Kuwait, Qatar, and Bahrain, uh, which consider uh, small countries, uh, are actually using three times more than a regular uh, everyday citizen, uh, which is quite striking. And apart from that, same energy models can be used for SCA calculations for uh, understanding the environment, environmental impacts. And also in the further stages, uh, scenarios uh, can be developed by using the dynamic uh, uh, stock modeling tools. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shaheen. Uh, nice to get some background on, on, on the region that uh, some of us are spending some attention to right now. Um, so the next speaker will be Ami uh, uh, Fuglset, and she uh, has a master degree in industrial ecology from uh, or in energy and environment from NTNU, and she her supervisor was Helge Bartebe, <laughs> and uh, Otbjorn was also involved in her master project. I, I, f I found out. Uh, she has spent uh, eight years at Asplan Viak uh, with Otbjorn and has recently uh, taken up a new position as a senior advisor on climate and materials for the Green Building Alliance in Norway. Um, and so uh, it is over to you, Mia. Thank you, Edgar. So I'll share my screen. Here we go. So thank you for the introduction. Um, as uh, Edgar said, I work in the Norwegian Green Building Council. I previ previously worked at Osplan as a consultant, and I'm going to talk about a report that I worked on there. And the title of my presentation is Old as the New New, because I'm going to talk about uh, the role of the existing building stock as a carbon mitigation measure. Uh, and in this study, we looked at 24 different buildings. As you can see, that they are very different indeed from very small sheds, large factory buildings, uh, municipal buildings, etc. Uh, they have different ages, different construction methods. And the commonality between all the buildings is that they have some sort of cultural heritage value that, and the, the premise for the study was that this uh, value should be preserved. And we looked at how we might. Um, refurbish and renovate these buildings uh, in order to increase the energy efficiency and then the climate benefit. So we looked at three different main scenarios. Uh, one scenario, we don't do anything, uh, just continue operation in the current state without any meshes. Then a retrofit scenario with target, uh, targeted energy efficiency measures that was also, were also in accordance with preservation of the cultural heritage values meaning that we didn't want to change the architecture or the external expression of the buildings too much. Uh, and we also looked at uh, demolishing the existing buildings theoretically uh, and erecting new modern buildings according to the current building code. 
And the main question we wanted to look at is when preservation and retrofit of older buildings is not only a cultural heritage measure, but also a climate mitigation measure. New buildings are becoming increasingly energy efficient, uh, in large part due to stricter energy regulations. Um, and also we are using uh, more materials, not only due to energy efficiency, but also other technical requirements, which means that the importance of materials for greenhouse gas emissions is increasing both in relative and in absolute terms. This is mainly for new buildings. When we looked at the result from the assessment of the 24 existing buildings, we saw that uh, uh, for the retrofit scenario, and obviously also for the current state scenario, the energy uh, demand and the energy use over the, the life cycle is still the most important factor contributing to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which led us to conclude that reducing energy demand is the single most important measure for reducing the carbon footprint of older buildings. As you can see, we also looked at different um, variations of the new construction scenario, both the standard building and a building with uh, focus on low, low carbon materials and also a passive house scenario. So when we say targeted energy efficiency measures, uh, what does that mean? Well, in most cases, energy retrofit of older buildings will be a trade-off between achieving a modern energy standard, but also preserving the building's original expression and qualities. That means that we, um, as far as possible, did not uh, assume that it was going that we were going to carry out an external external reinstallation of the buildings in order to not change the facade and the architectural expression of the buildings. But we instead assumed uh, a lot of different small and gentler measures for reducing the heat loss in the construction uh, and also increasing the efficiency of the heating system. Uh, are you changing from? Uh, regular convection panel heaters to ground heat pump. Uh, and also for the non-residential buildings, uh, we looked at uh, how we might optimize operational performance of the, the ventilation and heating systems. On average, for these gentle measures, we found that um, you could achieve actually quite significant energy savings on average about 40% across the different buildings. Uh, the extent, of course, of the different energy efficiency measures and the efficiency of the energy, uh, energy, energy system were very important factors that contributed to the energy savings and climate benefits. Uh, but in, in essence, the analysis shows that uh, you might achieve significant emissions and energy savings through these gentle measures uh, that do not compromise our cultural heritage value. So actually, for the majority of the buildings that we looked at, the carbon footprint was lowest for the retrofit scenario. Uh, Twelve uh, buildings um, where the, the upgrade or the retrofit scenario had lower carbon footprint over the life cycle. Seven buildings where the new construction had uh, the lowest carbon footprint. So this means that the general uh, gentle energy upgrade measures can provide significant both energy and, and uh, emission savings without compromising the, the expression of cultural qualities. Um, and this is very significant when we look at these cultural heritage buildings because it's not really an option to tear them down. So that means that we can um, implement measures that preserves the, the expression, but also gives some climate benefits. However, we also saw that the, the features and complexity of each building must be taken into account when designing these measures. Um, when we looked at the buildings where over the life cycle, um, the renovation or retrofit scenario was not the lowest in, in emissions, we also looked at the emissions payback time. That means we, as you see in the graph, the accumulated GHG emissions over the calculation period. Um, you can see the, the graph of the new construction, the green line starts higher than the retrofit scenario because obviously it requires more materials to construct a new building than to upgrade one. Uh, but the, uh, the black graph, the retrofit scenario, rises much more quickly than the green one because for each year it has a larger energy demand um, because the, the modern building is more energy efficient. Uh, and uh, after a while, the, the graphs uh, cross each other, which means that that's the point in time um, where the new construction is more uh, climate, climate efficient, so to speak, um, compared to the retrofit scenario. But that takes, in this case, 44 years. Um, and when we take into account the time that we have left to limit global emissions and reach our goals as a society, we do not have 44 years. 
And this points to the role that the um, renovation and retrofit might play as a significant climate uh, mitigation measure, even though over a longer time period, it's not regarded as more um, beneficial for climate because we have to take into account that we are running out of time. Uh, we also looked at a study that was mapping um, age, building type and cost of demolition for buildings in two different Norwegian municipalities as sort of an extension of this, this uh, study uh, to try to assess how much emissions might have been avoided if we do not tear buildings down but upgrade them instead. Um, we have to look at the cost of the demolition because it's only relevant to uh, to calculate this for the cases where the buildings were uh, torn down but replaced by the exact, exact same building function, as opposed to, say, densification or the buildings burnt down or they were replaced by roads and such. Um, so, But when we look at the cases where the buildings were replaced by an exactly same function building, the same, um, and not the same size, but the, the, the same function, uh, as opposed to, say, replacing it with a large, replacing one small residential building with a large one, say, for identification, we saw that even so that the buildings were increasing in size. Um, so for new residential buildings and cabins, where it's reasonable to assume that we are fulfilling the same fun function with the same amount of people, they were almost twice as large as the uh, demolished buildings that they replace. And if we then uh, assume that we uh, renovate buildings, if we also increase the building size uh, that would erode much of the environmental benefit from renovation. Uh, of course, this is not e as easy to assess with non-residential -resident buildings, but it is a very important finding because it, it points to that consumption cannot increase um, if we want to reduce emissions. We can't rely on efficiency alone. So when is building preservation a climate mitigation measure? Uh, of course, it depends upon the scope of measures, uh, the efficiency of the energy system and the specific preconditions of each building. I've included two clippings from Norwegian news sites here because they point to that um, it's easy to assume that retrofit and renovation is always better for the environment, but it's only the case if we significantly lower energy demands. And Norwegians are very happy to refurbish their buildings. Uh, we spend an amount of uh, 83 billion Norwegian kroner each year, which is the same amount that the Norwegian state spends on infrastructure. Uh, so we need to ensure that we reduce energy demand. Um, and the ex renovation of the existing building stock can be a relevant measure uh, because we have very limited time to reach our national and international emissions reduction commitments. So retrofit extends the building span, uh, building lifespan and postpones the need for new construction. Uh, the materials required for retrofit, obviously, are they cause relatively little emissions compared to a new construction. So targeted energy retrofit can provide emission savings with nearly zero payback. Thank you. That was a really nice closing, Mia. <laughs> um, yeah, quite interesting. I think we'll take some of those issues up in the discussion. Um, now we had one researcher and one practitioner, and then I have a researcher who has recently taken a step out into practice with his uh, own tool. Ne our next speaker is Eric Resch, and he comes from Reducer, um, which he will introduce here, his startup. Please, Eric. And Eric has a PhD in industrial ecology from no, in, sorry, in architecture, right? And the, and and in math, so uh, quite interesting. His master's degree is in industrial ecology. Yeah, correct. Thanks, Elga. So, uh, hi everyone. I'll tell you about um, the new tool for performing carbon uh, assessments of buildings and infrastructure, which is uh, called Reducer. It's uh, an online tool that you can find uh, on reducer.com. My name is Eirik, and as Edgar said, I have a master's degree in industrial ecology. Um, I also have a PhD in architecture and, and uh, applied math from NTNU and DTU. Um, so I took that uh, work that I did in research, uh, and, uh, and um, since um, 
we don't have much time to address the climate challenges and I, I wanted to uh, move this into practice. So I started a company, Reducer. And um, Reducer is, is, a is a tool for practitioners, but is also used by uh, a number of researchers. So uh, the, there are um, upcoming research papers that have been uh, using this tool as well. It's mainly for, for uh, spreading it out into practice. So uh, it makes it simple and accurate to do carbon accounting, helps you calculate, uh, work on reducing emissions and then report it uh, easily according to whatever scheme or environmental amb ambition that uh, you may have. So this started with, uh, with my research um, uh, in, that I ended in 2020. I'm still working part-time as a researcher at NTNU, but, um, but mainly with um, developing the software and um, the, the company uh, that I founded in 2021. So I've been working on this now for exactly two years. It's, uh, it's a two-year anniversary. Uh, this year, um, we have expanded with uh, quite some uh, uh, new people. And uh, uh, we have now 10 pilot customers that, uh, that are um, using this tool. Um, as their main tool, uh, we next year we will launch widely in Norway, and then we'll spread out to other countries in Europe. So, just a few words on this research that uh, that uh, is the background um, for this uh, software is my PhD that you can see here on the left side and one of my main papers. Uh, this uh, was also applied into a Norwegian. Um, certification scheme or a, a voluntary uh, program for environmental buildings, which is called Future Built. So I'll just uh, say very briefly a few words about this. It's a scheme for uh, both uh, uh, calculating emissions with the dynamic LCA and also sets a number of requirements uh, that uh, you can also call limit, limit values um, for constructions in Norway. So these limit values, they take into account that uh, we, we need to rapidly reduce emissions, so they're getting stricter each year that goes until 2050. So they get stricter quite rapidly, and we need to do these changes uh, quite fast. Um, so in um, yeah, this method is, is a dynamic LCI method um, that takes into account how things change over time, and uh, that the, the measures that we do today are more important than uh, what we do uh, 100 years from now. But back to uh, the software uh, reducer. So now I'll just explain a bit more about that. Uh, so feature built is one of the methods that you can calculate in reducer, but you can actually calculate with any any preferred method, and you can create your own uh, calculation methods here as well. So you can apply it, um, apply it to any certification scheme uh, for any country. There is a big need in the practice uh, for for a tool. Um, that uh, helps practitioners better apply this on buildings and infrastructure, apply LCA. So uh, the three main challenges that uh, that this can be, um, where this uh, challenge, this uh, need for a tool can be explained is that we need to get information about the building into the tools. And we need to connect the right environmental data. And we need to get the goals out, the goal achievement out in reports and in dashboards. So it's easily communicated out to the practitioners and the rest of the industry and to the governmental agencies. So Reducer solves these and makes it easier to do them. And it's also a tool where you can work practically on how to reduce uh, emissions. The first one of these uh, is to get information about the building into the tools. We have different ways of doing that throughout the different planning phases. Um, so in Reducer, you can follow the project from the earliest concept, early design, uh, and through uh, out all the rest of the planning phases until the final building is there, and you need to document it to, for example, governmental agencies. In the earliest phases, we use a lot of estimated data, generic uh, LCA values and uh, estimated data for uh, quantities as well. This is gradually re replaced so that at the end, when you when you have the final building uh, finished, 
then uh, you'll ideally uh, be left with only project specific data. Uh, in the early stages, we can use um, our early phase estimation tool. So there's very few parameters that you need to enter here to get a, a, a complete view of all the emissions in the building. Uh, because in the earliest phases, there's very little information available, but it's also when the most a lot of the uh, most important decisions are made. So then it's important to get a complete view uh, of the entire system boundary, uh, all the emission sources uh, from the earliest uh, stages. Uh, we're also working on uh, BIM integration from, from the 3D models since architects and engineers are using BIM models from the earliest phases. They should also be able to uh, rapidly iterate their BIM models and immediately see the results uh, in Reducer. Um, so when we're working with these um, LCAs of buildings, carbon assessments, then we need to evaluate different alternatives, and we're making that easy to create different uh, design alternatives and uh, actually compare then what the impacts are of the different ones and how which one you should go for to have uh, a better environmental footprint. Second one. Um, we need to connect a lot of different data so uh, because there, there's a lot of different data sources and we organize all of these into our own product library and make them comparable as best as we can um, make it easy to choose and compare the different products uh, we recently included uh, thousands of products from uh, one norwegian database and we are uh, constantly uh, integrating more databases Third one here is uh, is a goal achievement out in dashboard and, and report. So uh, you can choose any environmental scheme uh, and you get the results for that immediately. So you don't need to actually go through all the details of what should be included and not and how should it be calculated because that's done automatically. And you, you don't need to choose one either. You can choose many. Here are some examples from Norway, but uh, it could be um, other schemes from any country. And there's no extra work in doing that for, for different schemes. You, you just enter the data you want and you get uh, all of that uh, out in the correct uh, format in reports, PDF reports or dashboards. Uh, we have uh, 10 pilot customers now that uh, we are working closely with to improve uh, the tool. Uh, one example here is uh, Norgesus where we, where we uh, um, actually wanted to uh, map the exact product data from EPDs for, for the exact products and wanted to do that automatically. So uh, we made a solution for mapping the GTI number. It's an international product identifier and the Norwegian uh, uh, version of that, which is no number. So uh, act the actual EPD, EPD numbers can be connected quite uh, quite easily for, uh, for the data. If you, for example, have an economic accounting, you will have this product identifier. So there's uh, some, here's a bunch of reasons uh, why to choose reducer, but uh, instead of going through those, you can uh, you can go to reducer.com slash sign up if you want to uh, if you want to get in contact. Uh, instead of going through uh, all the rest of the benefits here, I'll just quickly show you the software. Um, reducer.com. So I'm just logging in. Here you can see my different projects. You can see the product library, different. Uh, product categories. You can search for different products. You can compare them by selecting them. There's a component library with different types of building components. So you can easily assemble a building based on, uh, based on, for example, selecting a wall type instead of the exact product. And we also have uh, templates or building archetypes actually um, for uh, some building types. And we are constantly adding more of those. So then you can really easily uh, create a new project. Um, here is one example project. So when I enter this, here we can see some uh, alternative designs throughout the design phases. Here we can select which uh, environmental scheme that we're using. We can easily switch between them and the results will be updated. Uh, if I open one of these designs, then we can see that here I've added just one uh, component, which contains four products. Uh, this is 500 square meters of uh, beams. So this is just a random example that I just added right before now. We can uh, here also switch schemes. We can also go into details on the calculation methods. 
uh, on the system boundary and on the limit limit values as well that we can see the limit value here uh, so the results are constantly shown live as you do changes you will you will immediately see the results both in the in a dashboard uh, and uh, in inside the, the workspace where you're working so here you can also compare and you can switch out products to see the effect of it and so on so that's what i had time for thanks thanks a lot eric uh, yeah quite interesting so we the epd has come back right this is data source that we discussed in the, in the first session i also found it interesting that that you had this temporal dim dimension uh, if I can also ask the other two speakers, me and, and Shaheen, to show themselves, because we're going to have a little bit of a discussion bef before we invite other people in. Um, I thought it was quite interesting because the dimension, the issue of time came up in, in all three presentations. Uh, for Shaheen, it was more backward looking, like what's the building cohorts that we have and the different architectural style. If you do a building cohort modeling, of course, you need to take that into account. The energy standards that existed at different times when the buildings were constructed that, that are important. Uh, whereas b both me and you, Eric, sh showed us calculations into the future because, of course, these buildings have a long lifetime. And then we make specific assumptions of how um, the energy mix develops or doesn't change, right? I mean, that's that's one question. Um, and, and how to take that into account in, in the LCA. And there was Tasreen in the Q&A pointed out, well, the EPDs, you know, they don't really look at... Um, at the demolition phase. And so um, because it is so far in the future, right? And we don't know, actually, we assume a 50, 60 year lifetime, but the building probably exists for much longer. And, and, and so this just moves out of our consideration horizon. So uh, I wanted to, you to reflect a little bit about this time dimension. Um, and and of course, I agree with me that, that the things that we do now are really important because the energy is probably going to decarbonize um, over the next 40 years, right? And at, at that point, like the higher energy use from the ret retrofitted buildings maybe uh, isn't so important, at least from a climate perspective. Uh, so I'm not sure who would like to take this this up. I can I can start. So um, um, I just want to say one word on EPDs first. So uh, in reduce we have uh, EPDs because EPDs are required by standards, uh, by governmental standards and so on. They they want the EPDs. Um, some of them are very accurate. Some of them are less accurate. But but that's what uh, what they require. Mm -hmm. You can also uh, you can also use generic values in 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 reduce so you, you can actually choose. And that brings me to the next point that you asked about because uh, calculation methods, and it also brings me back to Freya's presentation that uh, once we set our, some requirements for the government then we, we need to follow those and it's difficult to change. Well, I think at least it's important to make it easy to use different types of calculation methods and, and schemes uh, and system boundaries and data so that we can see the effect on it. And uh, if, if it's difficult to do that, then People will only follow the requirements, but if it's really easy to switch between them, then we can see the effect in the different uh, different uh, schemes, or and it's easier to actually evaluate uh, the performance in different uh, schemes and data. Yeah, so so I think that's important. But for uh, one of those are are uh, one of those uh, th things that one one can investigate is the time impact uh, with dynamic LCA, and as long as it's easy to do it, uh, like we're doing it, um, then then um you know um taking the temporal effect into account of how um production emissions will reduce going forward into the future transportation emissions are really being reduced and they will reduce more uh, into the future and so on and and carbon capture and storage and you can take those different scenarios and see how that will affect it quite mm. easily so even those those even though those things are very uncertain like how those will develop um the biggest uncertainty is assuming they will stay constant that's that's what i how i think about it like it's saying that everything will stay the same like it is now for the next 60 or 100 years that's definitely not the case yeah right mm -hmm. good in any exactly i 
Mm. I agree with with Aire here and and um, when it comes down to it, we know that there is no, no one single truth when we estimate emissions into the future is one of the reasons why the, the Norwegian standard for climate, uh, greenhouse gas emissions calculations for buildings requires you to use two different scenarios for, for emissions from electricity. And, and it comes down to that it is sort of a value choice from the, from the practitioner, which can be said uh, as a case for using weighting factors for weighting emissions that occur in, in the immediate future. Uh, heavier than than emissions that incur further into the future because we know more about what is occurring now and what has occurred already than what will occur. So I think that uh, I mean the, the method that Eric has been uh, involved in introducing with with future built in Norway, where actually time waiting is introduced. I think that is a step forward. Mm, very good. Um, so. So with all this focus of the EPDs and the LCAs and the you know higher level studies that that point to the importance of of the materials and and the construction process and and the design, do you, from your experience, uh, feel that has an impact? Do uh, decision makers take this into account? And and if yes, how? I mean, this goes mostly to me and 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 Eric from your experience. Well, I wish that decision makers, I mean, governmental <laughs> decision makers yeah. had taken this into account to the extent that they have done in Denmark. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't really seen that, although the entire industry has uh, said that the industry is ready to reduce emissions, that we could have emissions requirements for new buildings and that we have the data. Um, but it is a political barrier, I think. Mm -hmm. It, it is being required in more and more countries and also on the European level. So it, it's going to come, but the uh, uh, question is just like wh which exact year it's going to, to be uh, put into force, but it's definitely coming in the, the entire industry, especially in Norway and some other countries as well, are very eager to get started before the requirements get into uh, effect. So um, uh, it's definitely coming, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but you think that the, like a legal requirement is required and like a target value or something like that? Probably that's, uh, I think that's a good, uh, good way to mm. go about it. But then, then we need to uh, uh, assess the uncertainties. Of course, that's, that's the question. So uh, we need to have uh, a good methodology for, for calculating it. That's very standardized method. So there, it doesn't leave much choice uh, right. to, uh, um, to uh, um, to make uh, scenarios mm -hmm. and it also needs to be um, the same for the data so we need to have uh, good data at the bottom EPD data or or generic data it, it needs to be uh, sufficiently accurate and I think it is today I, th I think it is sufficiently accurate so that we can uh, we can set requirements there is of course uncertainties but mm -hmm. but I think we can start setting the requirements already Right, right. Um, I wonder whether any of the earlier speakers would, would like to, to uh, come in here, uh, if, if you are interested. Um, yeah, so, uh, so with that we, we actually see that the, you know, the EPDs, it seems like here the EPDs have, have, have sort of become a, a very important thing as a, a, as a data collection, as something where companies can, you know, provide information to users. Um, but there are, there's like the environmental footprint methodology from the EU uh, that tries to be a little bit more open and, and more standardized than maybe EPDs are. Um, and you know, there's normal LCAs. I, I wonder whether you have any reflection about these different uh, approaches that, that are being taken in, in the building industry. Well, I could say that um, one, one thing about the European um, system is that it's not established for the construction products in the yeah. way that EPDs are. and. I think, although we recognize that the weaknesses of, of EPDs, they, they might be inaccurate, they might be outdated, but broadly speaking, it gives a good picture and that we should work to try and um, increase the quality of the EPDs rather than changing to a different system because we are, we, 
really, really overdue with introducing requirements in the first place. So if we work yeah. to, to make EPDs right. as best as possible, then I think that's a good way forward. Yeah, yeah. You, you try to improve the system while, while you go along and use it, I think you, you're saying, and, and, and that sounds like a smart strategy. Uh, Faya, you were next. We can hardly hear you. Yes. <laughs> okay. I agree. We need to to run on parallel tracks here, like following the rules. And as uh, Eric pointed out, we should still be able to see what if we what if the method was slightly different and if we viewed it in another way. But the rules are now set, and we know from uh, several EU legislative. Uh, preparation and uh, legislation in preparation we know which direction it's going uh, in terms mm -hmm. of methodology and in terms of scope so these are the rules set out and these are the rules that the the billing regulations will have to adopt and and adapt to when they integrate it uh, but then as researchers of course also, of course also be critical mm -hmm. nico yeah, just uh, again, I, I, I talk from a very convenient position because in Switzerland, we have calculation rules for, for environmental uh, embodied emissions in buildings for quite a while. And and I, actually, I was recently uh, interviewed by the EPBD, like the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive from the European Union, because they want to establish something for the, for the EU as well. And um, I think it's very important to think also about how we get that these things implemented. I think Eric gave a, a bunch of examples, but I think having a standardized way to calculate and, and to, to have like the, the, the rule set is very, very important. And, and for us, it's, it's a huge advantage in the, like in the city, within the city administration for the buildings, we have a huge advantage because we, we have clear rules where we can do the calculations and, and like clearly say these 12 kilogram per square meter, um, that that is the... It's it's a very tangible number for us, and when I look at civil engineers or other like you know tunnel builders and so on, they they are completely overwhelmed right now. So I think it's very important to to push forward these standards. Very good. Um, I, I know Karine has raised her hands. I'm actually want to bring up a, a, a different issue, and it seems like you you all are, have become experts and. And you are involved in something that's very exciting and happening now. And so I wonder whether you have any advice to uh, to somebody who would like to get into this field. Um, you know, is this a smart thing to do? And and what, what are the pathways? And 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 what would you look for if you were going to start out uh, today? And so I'm giving it to Karine whether she wants to take this up or or the previous question that's up to her, and and then for the others to think about that. Please, Karin. Yeah, now my comment is a bit of a mix, actually, but it goes uh, first on the APD side. Um, yeah, so now maybe it's seen a bit as a black box from the research community, but in fact, if we have the opportunity to crack them in a way, uh, talking about open uh, access of the data, as we do in the research community, then, I mean, the, the data are back to APD. So, in fact, if we have access to them, then uh, it's a huge potential, um, actually. And uh, for advice to go to engage in this uh, debate, uh, yeah, and I think it's, uh, we should really see, uh, like it's the case today, as, as an ecosystem of different competencies, is that one of the other, we really have to do it together and uh, just start somewhere and then uh, let's see what the future brings, mm, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. anybody else? <laughs> yeah, Eric? I think this is a very exciting field to go into now because it's uh, it's a cross between uh, active research. There's a lot going on in the research development, and it's also a very uh, real issue that we need to solve really fast. So in this cross between developing research uh, continuously uh, and uh, actually getting it quickly into practice, uh, this is a quite very, very exciting field with a lot of opportunities um, during the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Good, Nico. Final word. I think we're. Oh, sorry. No, no. We have, we have another two minutes, but. Uh... Um, yeah. Again, maybe more the applied viewpoint. Um, I think something I'm realizing more and more is that the architect is really like the um, a little bit like the central point in the whole thing. Um, I think. Mm -hmm. If you want to specialize in the field, um, learn their language or become an architect who is also capable 
um, you know, of, of doing environmental calculations, whatever. Um, but I think it, it's very important because they always become like the, the central node and, and node in all these issues. Yeah, that's my take on this. Yes, I see that Shaheen is listening att attentively here. Uh, anybody else? Um, well, Shaheen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, as a person who comes from the architectural uh, background, I mean, uh, I think the inclusion of those environmental issues in the curriculums is quite important uh, because we are in the position of uh, sometimes uh, in the, in the uh, main decision maker in the projects and our collaborations with the different professions uh, starts with the education of the architects uh, themselves. Uh, I think I would be I would have a different kind of uh, mindset if I have introduced those kind of topics earlier in the bachelor years. Um, but right now in the uh, in the uh, also in the architecture field, uh, a lot of master programs and the PhD programs which are focusing on sustainable architecture, use of computational tools, uh, environment performance of buildings are uh, included. So I think it will create a great opportunity in the future. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I, it was my intention to finish now at, at, at 11.50 my time. Uh, we have another 10 minutes before the next session starts. Uh, in the International Industrial Ecology Day. So I would like to thank all the participants and uh, the speakers uh, for what I thought was a really interesting uh, discussion here and, and, and nice presentations uh, with 